so good to see you. We're going to praise Jesus. Is that all right? Come on, can I see your hands up? All right, come on, let's sing this. You have come and we have found life everlasting. Now what life to know your freedom never ending. You alone have made a way for us in your love. You are life. I'm living in the life of my Savior. Dancing in the arms of forever. I'm 
give him your cares. I Church, we're going to teach you a new song this morning. You up for it? The front row's up for it. What about up back? Are you ready? I love it. so good. It's a new song from our beloved Scotty and Brooke. And um, it's a song that teaches us of God's intervention in history through the coming of Jesus. It's a song that tells the story of our salvation, that tells the story of the church and our future hope of our soon coming King. First Timothy chapter six, six, verse 13. It says, our master Jesus Christ is on his way. He'll show up right on time. His arrival is guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler. High King, high God, he's the only one death cannot touch. His light so bright no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't take him in, but let's honor him. Eternal rule, oh yes. Let's praise the King of Kings this morning. Choir, will you teach us the chorus? Here we go.
it to be in the house of God. In the 11.15 a.m. service, this is a revival service right here. I don't know what you thought you were turning up to, but we're not just going through the motions of today. We are encountering Jesus and His goodness. Anyone believe that here? Sure, good to have you online with us. For those of you joining on the online campus, Hey, I want to declare something over you this morning. Uh, if you look to, all right, I'm going to do that. All right, so I want you to look at the screens and look at this scripture with me. Psalm 30, verse 1, a David psalm. I give you all the credit. I'm reading from the message translation. I give you all the credit, God. You got me out of that mess. You didn't let my foes gloat. God, my God, I yelled for help and you put me together. Look at this. God, you pulled me out of the grave, gave me another chance of life when I was down and out. How many of us believe here God can pull you out of your mess? I don't know what you walked in with today. I don't know what you're sitting with today. Maybe you're in a situation or some sort of challenge. How many of you know that God can pull you out of the grave? God can pull you out of the worst of the mess. And this is what I feel in my heart to do this morning. I wonder if we would just thank God. I wonder if we would just vocalize, just give gratitude, just thank Him for who He is. Thank Him for what He's about to do. Thank Him for what He's gonna do in, in our lives, maybe in that sickness. Come on, thank Him. Why don't you begin to thank Him, church? Begin to thank Him. Thank Him in the middle of the mess. Thank Him in advance. Thank Him for what He's about to do. Thank Him for who He is. Come on, exalt Him this morning. We glorify You, God. We thank You, God. You are a good God. We thank You, Father. Yes, God, we appreciate everything You're doing. Even when we're not aware of it, You're doing something in our lives, Father. In Jesus' name, church, in my hands here, I hold prayer requests, so many different needs. Some of them are gonna come behind me on the screen there, but people believing for provision and healing, new job, sale of their house, so many different things, restoration, marriages, Someone here is going on a missions trip, praying for protection, salvation. So many different needs, church. Come on. Why don't you stretch out your hands right now? And why don't you believe for God to intervene? Father, we thank you that even in the messiest of situations, as you declare, Lord, you can pull us out of the grave. God, you can pull us out of the mess. And so right now, we lift up family right now. We lift up sickness to you, God. We believe for healing. Lord, we believe for restoration in marriages, the mending of relationships, God. Father, we believe we declare your goodness into every single circumstance. We believe for complete turnaround. You're a good God, God, so do it. Do it right now, Father. Bring healing, bring hope, Father, in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship one more time, church. Hillsong Church. Man, it is so good to have you with us. If you're joining online as well, it's so good that you could tune in. And uh, so good that you're here. And uh, you could have been anywhere else. I mean, you could have been playing bingo, you know, the local RSL, I don't know. But you chose to be in church this morning. You've already won in my mind right there. So it's absolutely amazing. Hey, if you're new, 
or visiting, uh, feel right at home, feel like you belong here because you do, all right? So just be yourself. We would sure love to meet you. Out over here is our Western foyer. We've got a cool cafe over there with some really good homemade treats by some of our volunteers from what I hear. And we've got some scones. Our service pastor is saying we've got some beautiful scones. Do we really? Come here, come here. Tell everyone, what do we have? Yeah, we've got some scones. We've got some crackers with cheese and dips. And, um, you had us at crackers. You had us at crackers. Say no more. No, hey, all jokes aside, we'd love to host you uh, in the Western Foyer. Come to our lounge area. We, we would love to meet you and connect with you. And uh, it's just so good that you're here. Why don't you uh, take a moment right now and just say hello to someone. Welcome them to church. If you know them enough, give them a little kiss. Give them a little cuddle. Single people, that was your cue. My name's um, Peter Toggs and I'm one of the pastors here at uh, church. And I'm gonna bring some great praise reports right now. And uh, this is really cool. Nanette is praising God for healing her from cancer right there. So come on, let's really thank God. That is absolutely amazing. Someone here thanking God for supernatural healing of his grandmother, which is awesome. Thanking God here. Someone, Joy, thanking God for successful operations. And now I have a good health report, which uh, she's praising God for right there. Thanking God. Phil, thanking God for his, someone's provided him a job. His friend provided him a job. That's where you got to thank God for your friend as well, right there. So absolutely amazing. So revival's in the air, huh? Yeah, it definitely is. Hey, uh, it's Palm Sunday, believe it or not. And next week is Easter. And uh, Easter weekend is always, always beautiful here at Hillsong Church. We have our uh, Good Friday services. I wanna encourage you to make Jesus the centre of, of Easter. No doubt you will, but Christians all over the world are really gonna consider and be reminded of the completed work of the cross. I wanna encourage every family, every parent, every child to really be in church next weekend as we consider Him who died for us. And But here at Hillsong Church, we always make the special time special. Easter, Good Friday morning services, uh, communion, one hour communion services with Pastor Brian. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. He's gonna be speaking. And I love it, every, every year something great happens and uh, come along then. Good uh, Resurrection Sunday morning services, all right? Is absolute, there's gonna be a spirit of revival in the place. There, we, this, is, this is gonna be a victorious, triumphant place to turn up to, okay? You don't wanna miss it. So 8, 9, 8 a.m. in the hub, 9 a.m. here and 11, 15 a.m. It's gonna be absolutely amazing right throughout the weekend. And uh, don't miss it also right here. Chris, thanks very much. Chris Hodges right there. Kilo of Kindness. Uh, we um, have already begun our Kilo of Kindness appeal where we get to help tens of thousands of Australians that are going to be doing it tough this year. The great thing is you can go and get a physical bag out the front and uh, fill this up with non-perishable foods for yourself or you can go straight, you can scan that QR code there or you can go online and see what part you can play as a family or as an individual in helping many people this year, this, Chris, uh, this Christmas, this Easter. It's Easter. It felt like Christmas was yesterday, by the way, but so that'd be pretty awesome. Well, we're about to continue right now in our worship and our Hills Campus Pastor, Sam DeMauro, is gonna come and encourage us around our giving. Would you welcome Sam? Thanks, Pete. So I can't wait for next week. Easter's gonna be brilliant. Hey, I wanna encourage us around our giving and um, look for everyone here and those who are part of the service that are watching. Uh, I'm gonna give you a moment to prepare. On the screen, there's different ways that we give. Um, a lot of people actually um, are using the Hillsong app and uh, that's a really easy way to do that. But again, thank you so much. And look, if you are new or visiting, please, there's no pressure for you to be involved. You can if you like. Um, but what you'll discover is that we're not a have-to church. We've just got a whole lot of people that want to, which is pretty cool. 
Hey, look, as you prepare, I wanna encourage you, Proverbs chapter three, verse five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Do you know, I've been a Christian now 25 years and often life just doesn't make sense. You know, as a brand new Christian, someone who met Jesus at 22 and God literally turned my life around. I'll never forget a few months into this thing and full of the promise of God. And, and I literally had a week from hell. I mean, you could have written a country and Western song about this week. I lost my job and a 21% interest rate in the middle of a recession with no jobs with a mortgage. That's a big deal. Then I lost my girlfriend in the same week. I know, she's spewing now, but anyway. It was hard at the time. And then when it came to my car insurance, I was, I was deemed unregisterable, uninsurable. I mean, it was a week from hell. And to be honest, I actually felt like God had let me down. I didn't understand. All I could see was the end of a whole lot of things. But what I didn't understand and which He knew was actually gonna be the beginning of a whole new season. You see, because out of that was came the catalyst of leaving Geelong and moving to Sydney to go to Bible college in our Bible college. Out of coming to college here, I met my wife and uh, 25 years married next year. And not only that, you're stuck with me right here, right now because of what happened back there in 1992. I've learned I'm never gonna understand everything God's doing, but I can trust Him. And you know, when He tells us to tithe, to give Him our first 10%, we try and work it all out, but sometimes we're never going to work it all out. But I do want to say this, if God asks you to do something, you can trust Him because He is faithful and He does keep His promise and He does work all things out for good to those who love Him. So in this moment of trust, as we bring our first 10%, I want to say to you, God's faithful, amen? amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank You, thank You, thank You. We acknowledge You, You're our source. You're our provider. And Father, it's an honour to trust You with our tithe. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Host, if you'd like to host us, that would be fantastic. And as they do, watch the screens. You don't want to miss out what's coming up. Join pastors Brian Houston, Ben Houston and Gary Clark as they track the 40 mile journey from Nazareth to Capernaum. I've never walked for four days straight in my life. Through roads, lanes, winding tracks, and along towering cliffs. We're really going off road now. <laughs> you guys have cheated, you haven't done the whole walk. Guided by seasoned track expert, Moshe. Moshe, you told us today was the easy day. Somehow I forgot to warn them about the tiny, tiny hill. <laughs> you know what, when the highlights of the day? <laughs> and uncover amazing insights into Jesus' life. The message of Christ changed lives, healed lives, brought hope. So it's pretty crazy that he taught that there. This is where they wanted to shove him. Have a look. That's so scary. Join us on this incredible adventure. The Jesus Trek, only on the Hillsong Channel. How cool is that? How cool is that Jesus Trek show gonna be? I mean, Pastor Brian, as you've never seen him before, 
or you're probably thinking, no, we see him like that every week. It's great. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Hey, uh, Pastor Bobby is actually in LA right now, and they're in the middle of Colour Conference LA. And I know a few weeks ago we had Colour Conference Sydney, then uh, Pastor Bobby and a bunch of team went to New York, and that's already happened. Now she's in LA. And then from what I know, it's the Colour Tour. It's pretty much from the USA to Cape Town to London to Kiev. So keep Pastor Bobby, Bobby and the entire global team in your prayers and praying for them in your connection groups and everything like that, because uh, what Colour is doing is absolutely amazing, and uh, that'd be awesome. Well, are you ready for the Word this morning? Who loves Robert Ferguson? Need I say any more? Robert, you're so loved here. We absolutely love and adore you. He's going to bring a powerful Word this morning. So come on, would you stand right now, and online campus, would you welcome Robert as he comes to preach this morning? Thanks, Peter. You're a good man. You're a good man. Thanks, team. Did a brilliant job, as usual. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hello, wonderful people. I think adore is probably a little over the top, but uh, I like the fact that he likes me. Well, you can all sit down. It's my privilege and honor this morning not only to speak to all you wonderful people at Hills, but everyone online and on the channel, of course. And uh, I've been, this, this message has been brewing for months now. So pin back your ears, open up your spirits, open up your hearts. May I start by asking you a question? What is revival? We talk about it, we sing it, we sing it, we declare it. Our senior pastor Brian Houston has said revival is in the air, but what exactly is revival? My premise is very simple. If we're going to experience a future revival, we need to understand past revivals. That is what this message is about. If any of you know me, you'll know that I love revivals. Ever since I got saved 45 years ago, I've had a passion for revivals, moves of God. And I go to these places where revivals have taken place and I have an obsession with pulpits. I try and place myself in famous pulpits used by instruments of revival. Pulpits like John Wesley, George Whitfield, Howell Harris, C. H. Spurgeon, I've stood in their pulpits and my prayer is always the same. God, if there's any revival fire left in this pulpit, give it to me. A couple of years ago, I was walking through New York with my daughter-in-law and I passed the church where Henry Ward Beecher was the preacher back in the 1859 revival in New York. I wanted to get in, but it was locked. But we went round the back, a cleaner had left the door open. The cleaner was still in there, but we, I said to my daughter-in-law, just this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna run down the aisle, you with your push chair with my grandson, just run down the aisle and I'm gonna leap up onto the platform, take a picture of me as I'm praying, and then we're gonna run out again before the cleaner stops us. Here's the picture, that's why it's a bit of a a bad picture. Why is it important to have a passion about revivals? Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who wrote the book Preachers and Preaching, said the best tonic for the soul is an understanding of historical revivals. And in 1859, when C.H. Spurgeon was right in the heart of a revival in England, he challenged his congregation to read about revivals. So can I do the same with you? For the last two months, I've read a book about revival every week. And I intend to keep reading them until we see revival. Little homework, go home, find a book on revival, read it. I hope this message inspires you to do just that. So you ready? All right, we're gonna pray and then we're gonna get into this. Father God, thank you for these wonderful people both here and all those thousands of people online. Father, I pray that a sentence, an idea, a concept, a story in this message will grab our hearts and give us an anticipation, an expectation and a hunger for revival. We ask it in the precious and the most wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. 
On the 23rd of September, 1857, a man by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere, who C.H. Spurgeon described as an unknown and obscure man, he lived in New York and he had a passion that he needed a revival, both in his own life and in the city of New York. So he published a flyer saying that he would have an early Wednesday morning prayer meeting in New York to pray for revival. He turned up, no one else did. He prayed for half an hour and then one other person came. By the end of the hour, six people had come. Six people prayed for revival. God doesn't need a crowd. He needs someone who is hungry. He needs someone who is passionate. He needs someone who is desperate. And Jeremiah Lamphere was desperate. That was in September 1857. By January 1858, there were prayer meetings bursting out all over the city of New York. By March that year, 1858, Howard uh, uh, Beecher, who I've just referred to, Henry Ward Beecher, was leading a prayer meeting of 3,000 people for revival. By May of that year, 1858, 50,000 people in New York had become Christians. One person put up a flyer, one hungry person, desperate for revival, prayed for revival, and eight months later, 50,000 people had got saved. Now, think about it. That doesn't sound much when we had 50,000 people in a prayer meeting a few weeks ago, but this was in a population of 800,000 in New York. That is 6.25%. If the same thing happened today in Sydney with a population of 5.2 million, we would see 325,000 people saved in one year. I want you to think about that because if it did happen, it would wreck your Sundays. You wouldn't be able to get a seat, you wouldn't be able to get a car park, you wouldn't be able to get anywhere near the building. If we want revival, and I believe we're just starting it, if we want revival, it must change our lives, it must change our church, it must change our city, and it must change this nation. In the heart of that revival, Charles Finney said that 50,000 people were becoming Christians every week. And by the end of 1859, it has been estimated that between one and two million people in a nation of 30 million people had become Christians. That revival that started in the States moved to Ulster in Northern Ireland, to Wales, to Scotland, to England. It changed the face of the world. We say revival is in the air, but I've got a suggestion to you that we haven't even begun to see revival. It's starting, but it needs to be continued. So I'm gonna look at what the Bible says and what history teaches us about revival. If you turn to Acts chapter three and verse 19, it gives us possibly a the best definition of revival. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Leave it on the screen for a minute because I want you to see that there is a paradox here. Times of refreshing from the Lord. In other words, God is the initiator of revival. Times and seasons are in His hand. There is gonna be a season of revival, but we don't know exactly when it is. So is there anything we can do? Yes, we can repent and turn to God so that times and refreshing of refreshing will come from God. Times are in God's hand, turning is in our hand. We can't predict the timing, but we can choose the turning. All revivals are birthed in prayer and maintained by preaching. We've got to birth this thing in prayer and we've got to maintain it by a declaration of the truth that is going to change the very fabric of this society. That's what revival is. These seasons of refreshing. Now, if you look through the Bible, you will discover the Old Testament is a story of the people of Israel. And they were, like all humanity, 
rebellious and able to be revived. So their story is one of revival and rebellion. Revival and rebellion. Revival and rebellion. This is what it looked like. The people of God were revived. They got, uh, they got blessed and then they became complacent. They became familiar and they lost their enthusiasm. So God allowed them to go into a season of exile and rebellion. And when they were in exile and rebellion, they started getting desperate again, hungry, passionate for God. God, help us. And God helped them. And He restored them back to their place of rest. And then they got complacent again. And they just gave up, familiar. And then God allowed them to drift back into exile again. This went on over and over again. According to Ernest Baker, there are 17 such revivals in the Old Testament. If you want a summary verse, you find it in Numbers chapter nine. It says this, Numbers chapter nine, but as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight and then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. God is incredibly merciful. He's looking at our broken nation. He's looking at the moral fabric of our nation and He's looking for a Jeremiah Lamphere, someone who's gonna throw themselves on their knees and get desperate and say, I want revival. Now, I haven't got time to explain all 17 of these revivals, so I'm gonna just explain three of them because these three revivals give us an indicator as to what the pattern of revival in the Bible looks like. Still with me? So let's have a look. In Jeremiah chapter um, 29, the people of Israel are in exile, in rebellion, in, um, in Babylon. Jeremiah 29 verse 10. It says this, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years, notice that, God chooses the time. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come and fulfil my good promise to bring you back to that place. In other words, I'm gonna revive you. I've got plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future just like He does for us. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The timing is up to God. The turning is up to us. So they prayed for 70 years in accordance with the prophet. Evan Roberts prayed for 11 years in order for God to pour out the Spirit in his home country of Wales and it turned into the 1904 revival. How long are you prepared to pray to bring this to fruition in our world? Now, everything that was written in the past is written for our encouragement and our example. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 says, everything was written, was written down for our warning and our example. So what is these what is these, this revival? What happened when Jeremiah the prophet uh, prophesied? Well, in accordance with the Word of the Lord, 70 years later, there were three returns. First, under Zerubbabel. Secondly, under Ezra. Thirdly, under Nehemiah. Now, each of these three returns teaches us the three steps to biblical revival. You check out where we're at on this journey. The first return, number one, a return to worship in the house of God. A return to worship in the house of God. In 537 BC, Listen carefully, you may not be a historian, but remember, if we're gonna predict the future, we're gonna to have to look at the past. So in 537 BC, 70 years after Jeremiah prophesied, the first revival, the first re return took place. Zerubbabel returned, what did he do? He rebuilt the temple. He rebuilt the altar. You can read about it in Esther, sorry, in Ezra chapter three. This is what it says. He rebuilt worship 
That's where we're at as Hillsong Church. The first thing that happens is everybody starts worshiping again. That's what we mean by this revival in the air. You don't wanna miss Sunday nights. Revival is in the air. We've just sung one of our new songs that's gonna be on our new worship album. There's a new sense of worship, a new passion, a new enthusiasm. There's new excitement in every one of our services, not just here in Australia, but globally around all of our campus. A new worship is coming. We're rebuilding the altar. We're rebuilding the temple as it should be. But that's the first step. Whenever revivals took place, that's what happened. So in 1859 in Wales, they had a prayer meeting. They didn't just have four people turn up, 18,000 people turned up in a field and the leaders couldn't pray because there were were a sea of worshippers and the billows, they said the billows of praise coming from the field overwhelmed anybody who was speaking. So we're there, but we're not there yet. But after that return, there was the second return. Number two, a return to the Word of God in our lives. So first, Zerubbabel returned, but then in 458 BC, Ezra returned. He returned with the Bible. He returned with the law. He said, you want revival? Well, you're gonna have to repent. You're gonna have to give your lives to God. You can read about it in Ezra chapter seven. The truth is, we aren't there yet. It's fine saying the revival is here, but it hasn't changed any of our moral lives. It hasn't changed the moral lives or fabric of the society in which we live. But all historical revivals, people cried out to God. In the 1859 revival in, in, Wales, uh, in Ulster, and this is right across the board, in the 1859 revival, in the middle of the marketplace, people would fall on their knees and cry out to God in mercy. They'd have to be carried off. Until we see people in the shopping centres calling on God, not worrying about anything else, we haven't seen revival yet. One young boy in the 1859 revival came to school and he said, I've just got saved. And all his class started weeping. So then he called them all out and they had a prayer meeting in the play area until the entire school was weeping, including the teachers. And they closed the school down and rang up a minister and said, what do we do? That's revival. Revival needs to change our moral fabric. In the 1859 revival in uh, Ulster, there normally was 10,000 people at the local race course every Saturday, but in the revival, it went down to 500. Yesterday, our race race course was full. But in revival, it will change everything. It changes what we do on our Saturdays. The whiskey distillery closed down in 1859. The pubs closed down. In one county, in the middle of that revival in Ireland, there was, for a few weeks, there was absolutely no recorded crimes. We haven't even begun to see that. Even the Christians haven't changed yet. God wants to move us to stage two, but it has to return to the Word of God in our lives. And then and only then can we get to stage three. This is where it really gets fun. Stage three is a return to witness in the land. First, Ezra built the temple. Second, uh, sorry, first Zerubbabel built the temple. Second, Ezra rebuilt the Word. Third, Nehemiah returns in 444 BC to bring the city of Jerusalem back to its centrality. I want you to see this for a minute. In Nehemiah chapter seven, we can read about it because is it seven, Nehemiah, whatever it is, nine, seven, seven, two, 2 verse 17, 
You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Jerusalem was the centre of the Judaistic faith. Are you with me? It was the centre of Israel, but it had been broken down and they'd They were in disgrace. Well, I would like to suggest that currently in Australia, the church is not central. Comedians make jokes about ministers. The media attacks the church. The church has lost its central place in the community. But if we return to worship, if we return to the Word, then suddenly the church is rebuilt in the centre of the community and it's seen as a lighthouse. It's seen as the place where you go for hope and good news. A number of years ago, I was on a plane, asked the person next to me what he did for a living. He said he was a senator in our nation, he said, what do you do? And I said, uh, I'm a preacher. And he said, you know, that was usually the end of the conversation. But I said, you and I are on the same page. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So do you want the nation exalted? Isn't that why you're in politics? He said, yes. And I said, well, so do I but you need to know how revivals work. So for the hour that we were on the plane, I told him how revivals worked. I said that preaching must come before politics. Revivals must come before reform. Wesley must come before Wilberforce. I said, you cannot legislate morality. Your job is to release me to do my job so I can change the heart of the nation toward God and then the heart of the nation will demand reform. In four weeks' time, we're going to have an election. And please vote because voting is important. And law. (laughs) You have to do it. But it won't change the moral fabric of this nation. Our responsibility as a church is to pray. Now, this man was so intrigued, he said, tell me more. So I said, well, when... John Wesley was in the 18th century. He preached 45,000 times, turned England from a place of revolution to a place of revival. In the middle of that campaign, William Wilberforce, the politician, got saved and with encouragement from Newton, went into politics, wrote in his diary, I am committed to two things, the reformation of manners and the abolition of slavery. He did both of those things in his lifetime. I said to the senator, if you let me do my job, we will reform this land. He said, I think we need to talk further. He said, could I see you tomorrow morning? I cancelled my meetings, went to see the senator. He said, is it okay if I take that verse from Proverbs and make it my political statement? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. I said, go ahead, put it on your wall. Use it as your mantra. You get in the idea. Everybody say worship, word, witness. That is the pattern of revival in the Old Testament. All right, now let's have a look at what happens in the New Testament. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones and Preachers and Preaching said, all revivals are a return to Pentecost. So I've given you a couple of, uh, I've given you a couple of bits of homework. Go home, find a book of revival, read it. But here's the second bit of homework. Read the book of Acts. Check out how the revival of Acts took place because all revivals have these ingredients. Now, I'm going to do something a little difficult, different. I'm going to talk about a parable. I'm going to turn with, to Esther, Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1 is the story of Esther, one of the interesting books in the Bible because it doesn't mention God, yet God is central. They're in the season of exile. They're in Babylon. Remember, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, they're all, in, they're all in exile, as is Esther. And one day the king decided to have a party and he decides to invite people to his banquet. I'm going to read it 
then I'm going to draw out some ideas. Because I was reading this recently and I thought, hey, this is a description of revival. So let's, let's look at Esther chapter 1. And uh, Esther chapter 1. For a full 180 days. So notice there's a season of time, a time of refreshing. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendour and the glory of his majesty. This is King Xerxes. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen of purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver and mosaic pavement of porphyry. Imagine if you, if you were living in the slums of Susa, imagine what this was like. You just wandered in thinking like, whoa, I didn't even know what porphyry was like you. Pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. This is some party. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. All right, write these seven things down. You with me? The regal initiative. This wasn't chosen by the people. This was chosen by the king. Revivals are initiated by God. And when they come, they come suddenly. And God's suddenlies require human immediateness. Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, when they were praying suddenly, verse 2, it says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. In 1949, when a few people, including Duncan Campbell, knelt down in a small room in the Hebrides in the north of Scotland, they prayed and he wrote, at three o'clock in the morning, God swept in. They got up and in the middle of the night went out onto the street and lights were going on in every croft, in every house. People, as they saw, repenting on their knees. Some coming out into the streets, falling on their faces, repenting. Fishermen coming in from fishing during the night. No knowledge of what had been prayed fell on their knees, on their decks, giving their lives to God. That's what we need to see. That's what revival looks like. That's what needs to happen. A change in people's lives. God wants to come suddenly. I don't believe it's happened yet, but God is just opening the door of His banquet. What about this? The King's glory. Revival is a display of glory. It's not about you and your well-being. It's not even about the nation and its salvation. Revival is about the display of God's glory. He's basically opening his doors and say, check this out. You wanna know what I'm like? You wanna know what heaven's like? Have a look at this. That's what the king did. And he just opened his doors. In Acts chapter seven, when uh, Stephen is being martyred in the early church, it says, he full of the Holy Spirit saw what? The glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory in the Old Testament is, uh, is a word, chabod. It means the weight and the worth of something. So gold has glory. In 84, I went to a gold mine and I was handed an ingot of gold to hold. It was incredibly heavy and it was worth a quarter of a million dollars. It had weight, it had worth, it had glory. It didn't say, look at me, I'm weighty. Look at me, I'm worthy. It just had it. God doesn't say, praise me because I'm worthy. He just is worthy. He is weighty. That's what worship is birthed in. You get a revelation of glory and you just go, wow. That's what happened in 1906 in the Azusa Street Revival. 
the glory of God was manifest in the building in the form of a cloud. And anyone who walked into that cloud was changed miraculously. One lady came in, she had uh, broken teeth, all her teeth were rotten. So she came into the meeting in 1906 and someone walked up and prayed. She sat her down, put a handkerchief on her lap and prayed and all her rotten teeth fell out onto the handkerchief. She just wrapped them up to throw them away and then put her finger in this person's mouth and just put her finger around her gums until two sets of brand new teeth were grown in their place. In the glory, anything can happen. But remember, it's not as exciting if you're not into it. In the 18, that meeting in Wales in 1859, when those 18,000 people were in that, that praying, one half converted person walked into the meeting, heard them and left. And he was asked afterwards, why did you leave? And he said, I didn't see 18,000 people. I saw one person and that was God Himself. And this place is too terrible for me. My flesh, he said, is too unable to deal with this glory. Do we really want God to turn up? I do, but don't think it's all going to be a light matter. You might not be able to get your seat next week or your car park. Are you with me? Number three, whatever we're at. Number three, the subject's invitation. Revival is inclusive and generational. The king said everybody's invited. Every socioeconomic group, every ethnicity, every age group, rich, poor, come, 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 come. That's what happens in revival. It's not for the clever. It's not for the intelligent. It's not for the good. It's not for the nice. It's for the hungry, the desperate, the enthusiastic. In 1841, Robert Murray McCheen was in Dundee in the middle of a revival. So he went around the town and he found 39 separate prayer meetings, 39, of which five were attended and led exclusively by little children. We're not in revival until you go to pick your kids up after church and they refuse to come because they're praying. That's revival. And incidentally, my daughter got filled with the Holy Spirit at the age of five. We asked her, do, we, do you want prayer? She said, no, it's got nothing to do with you. She said, it's to do with me and Jesus. And then a few weeks later, we saw her hands in the air, worshiping Jesus, speaking in tongues. We need a revival among our children. Number four, a royal liberality. Revival is abundant. O.S. Hawkins in R.T. Kendall's book on tithing said there cannot be revival without hilarious giving. And wherever there is hilarious giving, there will be revival. God is proffering a cup to you and He says you can have what you want. You can be as holy as you want. You can be as blessed as you want. You can be as full as you want. You can have whatever you want. Think about it. Dan, you are as holy today as you chose to be. You read your Bible today as much as you chose to read it. You prayed today as much as you chose to pray. God is proffering you a cup and He says, how much do you want? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. Still with me? Number five, the bride's response. Revival always attracts religious opposition. There's always a group of people who say, I don't want revival. I want my seat. I want my car park. I want comfortable Christianity. Reading your Bible every week is not Christianity. Coming to church every week, listening to a sermon by someone who's done all the hard work for you is not revival. <laughs> Revival is when God arrests you, takes hold of your heart, fills you with His Spirit, so you long to do what He wants. But there's always a group out there who say, oh no, we don't want any of that. 
When Xerxes opened his doors, he invited his bride, Vashti, and Vashti refused to come because she was having her own party. There's always a bride. When God sends the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's gonna open the door of His banqueting table and tragically, the religious are gonna refuse to come. So He's gonna say, go out into the highways and the byways and invite the marginalised, the broken, the damaged and the hungry and the desperate and they're gonna come. Well, I don't wanna be the religious opposition. I wanna be the hungry and the desperate. And that brings us to number six, the exile's opportunity. I love this. Revival always draws the unchurched. Broken people, damaged people, drunk people. The stories are unbelievable how God changed lives in an instant. Esther was one of the exiles. She wasn't the bride. She was one of the invitees. She didn't deserve it. She was not worthy, but she put her hand up and said, I'll be the bride. I'll be the bride of the King. I'll do it. So the King made her beautiful over a period of time. And then she became queen. And as a result of becoming queen, the people of God were saved and the laws of the land were changed. I wanna be Esther, I wanna put my hand up and say, I'm not worthy, make me worthy. I'm not beautiful, make me beautiful. I, I wanna be part of the King's entourage. I wanna be in the palace. I wanna be with the King. I wanna be part of His bride, count me in. And that brings us to number seven and finally, the Kingdom's reform. Revival always leads to reform. The laws were changed as a result of Vashti's refusal and Esther's acceptance. They changed the law of the Medes and Persians in keeping with the revival. I am believing that in 50 years time, they're gonna talk about what God did in 2019, a change. If, if it can happen to Jeremiah Lamphere, it can happen for me. If there then here, if then, then now, if them, then us. Why not? Why not? I'm hungry. And with this I'll finish. C.H. Spurgeon stood up in the beginning of that year, 1859. And he said, currently a breath of the Holy Spirit is on the church. And I would say that's exactly the same for Hillsong Church. A zephyr of the Holy Spirit is on our church. But he said, I don't want a breath. He said, I want a mighty gale of the Holy Spirit. I want a violent wind that is gonna come. You, I've got the book in which he records that prayer. By the end of that year, that's exactly what took place. 1859, mark it in your diaries. 2019, mark it in your diaries. I'm believing that God wants to turn up, but there's a pattern. Return to worship, return to the Word, return to witness. God's gonna take the initiative. Timing is in His hand, but turning is in ours. Amen. Let's all stand. Team's gonna come. We're gonna pray for revival. We've got uh, nearly 20 minutes. Here's an opportunity for you to go home early. Get out of the car park quick. Miss the traffic. Get an early lunch. Alternatively, you could just hang out for a few minutes and worship Jesus. Amen. Yes. Team, where are you? Wonderful people. That's what we're going to do. Who here? Because if we're going to have revival, we've got to start with individuals. Christmas Evans, one of the great revivalists, said the church needs a revival. The world doesn't need a revival because a revival suggests something that is revived. 
We are already vived. We just need reviving. What the world needs is a resurrection, which is why we're having Easter celebrations. Amen? So it may be that you're in this auditorium or watching online, and at this point you go to church, but you haven't had a resurrection. You haven't been born again. You haven't got a real, personal, current relationship with Jesus. Just close your eyes for a minute. If you're in this auditorium, And you know you don't know Jesus. I mean, not personally, but you'd like to. I'd love to include you in a prayer. Why don't you just be bold, just be real? While people are praying, if you don't know Jesus, but would like to, you say, well, what is he gonna do? He's gonna come into your life, forgive you, give you life, change you, give you purpose, and connect you with his Father, God in heaven. That's a pretty good deal. You've just got to put him in charge. So who would like that to happen? I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, you put your hand in the air as a sign that you want Jesus to come into your life. One, two, three. Put your hand up. Fantastic. Hands going up right around this auditorium and I'm sure everyone online. Anyone else? Maybe you walked away from God. You want to get back to God. Put your hand in the air. Fantastic. All right, put your hands down. Now, normally, I would just pray a prayer and we'd all pray it, but I thought it'd be better to do something that happened in 1859. In 1859, in Ulster, they had a commitment card and everybody who gave their life to Jesus prayed a prayer. I put it on your seats. So this is the third bit of your homework. I'm reading a book on revival. I'm reading the Acts of the Apostles and I'm praying this prayer every day, and I intend to keep praying it until revival hits. So we're going to pray it as a commitment. Of course, you don't have to if you don't want revival. Here it is. Are you prepared to pray it? This is a dangerous prayer. If you just put your hand up, this is especially for you. This is the beginning of a journey. For those of us who've been saved for a long time, this is a continuation of the journey. Still with me? All right, everybody say, my covenant. I take God, the Father, to be my God. I take Christ, the Son, to be my Saviour. I take the Holy Spirit to be my sanctifier. I take the Word of God to be my rule. I dedicate, oh, sorry, I take the people of God to be my people. I dedicate my whole self to the Lord. And I do this deliberately and sincerely and freely and forever. Amen and amen. Peter's going to come up and talk to you about what, how we can help you if you prayed that the first time. But before he does that, can we pray? You may notice that the team are not playing because I asked them not to. Because I always offend them. They start playing and I say, shut up. So I thought I'd tell them to shut up before I offended them. That's nice. I thought that. And, um, but the reality is, ultimately, revivals are birthed in prayer. It is prayer, not play, that is going to bring revival. So what we're going to do, you're going to come up. Annie's going to come up. Paul is going to come up. And we're going to pray for revival. Just for a couple of minutes. Is that okay? We're going to believe God for revival. Who would like a revival? You want a revival? Do you want God to turn up in power? Well, we're going to believe God. We're going to, we're going to believe God together and then we're going to be led in worship. We're going to just worship Jesus because remember, it starts, the first step is abandoned worship to God. So we're going to pray. Go for it. All right, come on, let's lift our hands, church. 
Father, we come before You, God. We are so hungry for revival. We're we're hungry to see revival break out in our nation, Lord. And we pray, God, that You'd be arresting hearts. Lord, we pray that there'll be a transformation of the hearts of the people in our cities, in our nation, God, that we would see Your change sweep this land, Father. Lord, we're hungry for You. We're desperate to see You move. Holy Spirit, fill fill us afresh. Revive us, God. Lord, stir up the fire, the passion that's within us. Lord, that we would seek You like we've never seeked You before. God, that we would worship with a fresh voice, with a fresh song. Lord, that we would hunger for Your Word, that we would desire to see miracles and Your power doing things that that have never been seen before, Lord. God, do it in us, that we would see it done in our nation, Father. God, we lift Your Name up. Jesus, we exalt You. We glorify You in Your almighty, powerful Name. And Jesus, we offer our lives afresh to You today. No matter how long we've been walking with You, no matter how long we've known You today, we offer our hearts afresh. God, be the very centre of our lives, the centre of our hearts, where we have drifted or miss allowed something else to take your place, we ask for forgiveness, Jesus. Be the centre of our hearts, the centre of our thoughts, the centre of our lives. God, let it, let it be real. Holy Spirit, breathe again afresh on our lives. Let there come an awakening, Lord. An awakening, a new revelation, a new hunger, a new stirring, a new desperation for You, for a real, true, authentic relationship with You. And Jesus, we return to worship and we return to Your Word if we have drifted and we return to witness to people and to tell people who you are, God. We want to be your mouthpiece, Lord. We want to be your church. We want to be the people of God. And so, Lord, let a flame start to burn and let it be real and let it grow and let it change our lives and let it spill out into our communities and into our families and let it bring change, not so that we feel great, but so that we reflect your glory, we reflect who you are and that we are bright and beautiful as your church should be and that people will be drawn to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's start. I want you to start praying for just one person in your world right now that you know needs to meet Jesus. I want you to start lifting up that person towards God. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we thank You that You have positioned God, every single one of us, for exactly where You need us in this season, God. That in universities, that in high schools, that in families, that in workplaces, Lord God, You've placed us exactly where You need us, God. And so I pray that in this season, God, allow us to be a beacon for You, God. God, allow us to live lives that would reflect You in such a way, God, that people would be drawn to us, Jesus. Lord, we thank You, God, that there is a revival happening, God, of people coming home, God, of souls coming back into the house of God, of people coming back into this place, Lord God. And Lord, we thank You that, God, as we live our lives that reflect You, Jesus, God, that something miraculous is going to happen, Lord. Lord, I thank You for opportunities, God, and conversations, God, that are going to happen this week, God. They're going to give us a chance to share our faith with someone, God. Give us boldness and confidence, God, to step out in that, Lord God. Lord, we thank You, God, that we are not in any place by accident, Jesus but that you're suddenly is coming, God. And we want to be ready for what you're doing in your mighty name, Jesus. Yes, Father, Amen. you've said in your Word that blessed are they that hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And Father God, we say that we are hungry. You've said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Well, we say to you, we, we are thirsty. You've said you're going to pour out water on the dry ground, rain on the wilderness, Wilderness. We are dry ground. We are wilderness. Pour out your Spirit in accordance with your Word, we pray. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Just the team are going to lead us just for one song, but I want you to really get this. I genuinely believe the King is just opening the gates to display His glory. How we respond at this point will determine how wide the gates are open. Amen. Let's lift our hands around this auditorium and let's sing this song together. Holy Spirit, rain, falling like a flood, break upon my praise as I sing.
doing something in here and stirring a revival in people's hearts. Robert, thank you so much again for pouring and investing into us. And, um, you know, I love what Robert brought this morning because not only did he declare revival and continues to declare revival, I love that he taught us revival and what it's all about. And uh, I can't wait for a part two of that, if there is a part two. I'm sure there will be. It's absolutely amazing. So one more time, really thank Robert people's hearts being stirred here this morning. And also a big congratulations to those of you that prayed that prayer uh, from the bottom of your heart. You really responded maybe for the first time. I know we all uh, prayed that prayer, but for people here, maybe it was the first time or maybe it was a real time for you the second time where you decided, man, I, I really want to give my life to Jesus. A big congratulations to you. When the service finishes, which will be in a few moments in the different exit foyers, there's going to be someone waving this Bible around, okay? So walk up to them, say something like, hey, I prayed that prayer, and they would love to gift you this Bible on behalf of our church to mark this day where you decided to follow Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. So come on, let's congratulate again those of you who made that decision. Absolutely amazing. But well, what a day in church. And uh, tonight, everyone say tonight. We are continuing our revival nights. And I've got to tell you, these nights are absolutely impacting in every way. And tonight, bringing the revival fire is Sanger Sam Ways. And if you know Sanger, he's much loved in our church, but he knows how to leave space for the Holy Spirit. He's going to move. He's going to pray for people. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. So come, this place will be packed out. It's going to be amazing. 5 p.m. over in the epicenter, 6 p.m. here. Bring friends, bring family. I'm telling you, it's going to be one of those nights you don't want to miss out. And again, 
Also, I just wanted to remind you that 45 minutes, in just in, in context to what Robert was talking about, 45 minutes before every service, we actually have a prayer service gathering. And it's a prayer revival meeting that prays for every meeting we're about to go into. We don't just have church meetings. There are people actually stirring up faith to see salvation, to see healing, to see miracles take place. So if, if you ever wanted to be a part of that, come, be a part of it 45 minutes before every service. So 6 p.m. tonight, it's gonna be 5.15 over here in the Western Foyer or over there in 5 p.m., which is 4.15 as well, okay? So it's gonna be amazing. Can I pray for you before you go? Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your people. Lord, revival is in the air. And I speak that into every family, every household, every marriage, every businessman. Lord, I thank you that this week you go before us. Lord, protect. Lord, provide. I pray for every single family, God. Lord, we thank you that this will be a week of victory and revival. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone set together. Amen. Amen. We'll see you tonight, church. See you soon. All right, church, we're gonna go out praising Jesus. Hands up. All right, every voice, we sing. You have come and we have found life everlasting. Now we're alive to know your freedom never.